Good time of day, guys! My name is Godzi, and welcome back to another episode of Saya no Uta. Uh, there's currently no music, so that's <laughs> a little awkward, but oh well. Uh, last episode, uh, Koji got rescued by Dr. Tanbo, who is apparently, like, uh, well, not legitimately a secret agent, but she's been doing secret investigations into Dr. Ogai. And she found him, he's dead. Uh, yeah. And I get the feeling we're at least coming up on the end of this ending. I, I, I haven't received any confirmation as to whether or not there's multiple endings, but I feel like there has to be. Uh, there's only been one choice, but I don't know. It can, that, that can be the difference between one ending and another. So yeah, uh, either way. And I feel like it obviously would be, uh, based on the nature of that choice, but Oh, well, I don't know if we're, like, gonna be done with this ending this episode or what, but we'll see. Either way, let's get into it. When Ryoko looks up, the morning sun is already streaming in through the window. Tired from hours of pouring over files, she removes her glasses and massages her aching eyes. Her dreams are always filled with horror, yet the night she just spent was more nightmarish than them all, and it's not over yet. She has only just set foot on the threshold. As expected, the files left by Ogai Masahiko were not the sort that Ryoko could simply pick up and read. Fortunately, Ogai had been too old-fashioned to put his trust in electronic media. If... Eh, if he'd encrypted his files on a computer, she'd have had to find a hacker to decipher them. In fact, he had not employed any kind of code in his writing. That would have been too time-consuming by hand. The method of obfuscation he did use was quite simple. Of the files Ryoko pulled from his underground lab, the majority turned out to be notes and theses from Ogai's days as a student. The important papers were the diaries and research notes that had been scattered throughout the piles of worthless scrap. At first, she was unable to understand the documents that she had found, but each sheet was covered with text on one side and blank on the other. Each line was completely unrelated to the next, making it impossible to glean any meaning from the whole. The trick revealed itself, however, while she was sorting the pages that made no sense. She found that each line continued on the same line of a different page. Cool, that's interesting. In Ogai's diary, for example, the first day began on the first line, then continued not with the next line, but with the first line on the next page. Similarly, the second day was the second line, the third day was the third line, and so on and so forth. After filling all the lines on one set of pages, Ogai had torn them out and scattered them among his other files. There was no regularity to how the pages were numbered, of course. Unable to locate any sort of key or legend, Ryoko had no choice but to figure out the page order manually. Despite knowing that the task would be exhausting, Ryoko set, it, set to it valiantly. After separating all of the loose leaf sheets from the jumbled files, she began the painstaking process of linking pages together according to the contents of their first line. She found that Ogai had dismantled and scattered his diary each time he completed a number of days equal to the lines on one page, and had done the same with his research notes every 30 pages or so. The diary was much easier to restore, because the entries varied in length. Uh, later pages had a larger number of blank lines. The page with only one line, therefore, was the last page of the diary, and those with the most blank spaces could be considered closer to the end. Ryoko's perseverance has paid off, for she has already succeeded in restoring several volumes of Ogai's diary. As she reads them, she feels despair draining her spirit, as it has so many times before. This cursed feeling of powerlessness that comes with knowing hidden truths. Those who have tasted it once shall be beaten down by it again and again, until the day they die. All secrets are connected, after all. Once you have glimpsed even the tiniest fraction of the world's true face, you have no choice but to watch in horror as the veil rolls itself back inch by inch. All that remains is to wait for the day when insanity will crush your reason under its ever-mounting weight. I have succeeded- oh, I'm guessing she's just reading it out loud. I have succeeded in communicating with the organism. It shows enormous curiosity and its intelligence is beyond doubt. 
See research notes for confirmed vocal patterns and body language. Its appetite for knowledge is insatiable, and its learning speed is off the charts. However, it exhibits absolutely no desire to be recognized as an individual. Its ego appears to be quite weak, suggesting a psyche wholly unlike that of a human. The speed of the organism's linguistic development is astounding. When I laughed at its mispronunciations, it immediately picked up the concept of puns. <laughs> Ever since, it has been employing its entire vocabulary in an attempt to find puns that will make me laugh. Perhaps in a few days' time, it will have learned enough language for us to communicate freely. The organism's command of spoken language is now sufficient to facilitate higher level discourse, but although it has regaled me with questions all day, it remains unable to answer any of mine. Its reply suggests that it gained awareness only after materializing in this universe. It has no knowledge of where it came from. While I am disappointed, the fact that it has reached this level of intelligence only one week after starting to think tells me that there is no end to what I can learn from it. Hypothesis. It is not a naturally occurring organism, but was created by an even more sophisticated sentient life form. This would explain why it has no ego yet possesses such a hunger for knowledge. It might be some sort of reconnaissance drone that was sent here from another world. Hmm. I thought he had created Saya, but he discovered her? I see. Ryoko smiles humorlessly for the umpteenth umpteenth time since she started reading. How wonderful it would be if she could laugh the diary off as the delusions of a madman or the work of a science fiction author. Ironically, I get to do that latter part, haha. <laughs> Alas, she knows far too much. When she thinks back to the many horrors that Ogai brought into her life, the words before her take on chilling credibility. I have confirmed that the organism's brain power far surpasses any human's. This morning, I taught it about prime numbers. After I explained the Lucas Lemmer test for Merceni, for Mersenne primes, it immediately began to list examples that it had calculated in its head. I was only be able, to, able to confirm by memory up to number 10, M89, but it continued to list further examples without any trouble. I left it to its calculations, and when I returned a few hours later, I discovered that it had written down more than 70 of them. Computers all over the world are currently working to calculate Mersenne primes, but the last one I remember being found was the 39th back in 2001. Hmm. When I entered several of the results into my laptop and ran the Lucas Lemmer test on them, I found that every one was correct. The same is no doubt true of the rest. I don't know what a Mersenne prime is, um, I, but I'm kind of curious, so I'm gonna look up what it is. Mersen Primes. Mersen Primes, MP, are closely connected to perfect numbers. In the 4th century BC, Euclid proved that if 2 minus 1 is prime, then 2 times 2 minus 1 is a perfect number. In the 18th century, Leonard Euler proved that conversely, all even perfect numbers have this form. This is known as the Euclid Euler theorem. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> what specifically is it? Closely connected to perfect numbers. What does that mean? What are examples? Um... Um... I don't get it. But wait, th when was Saya no Uta written? Because it says the 39th back in 2001. But they found... It says here they found the 47th in 2009. Where- where's the- If I- if I type in 40, does it show? No, it doesn't. 40th? No. Okay, um, it doesn't really matter that much. I, I was just kind of curious, and it's, uh, very difficult to understand, so cool. After all- Oh wait, after all, the organism has never shown the pathological need for respect that would lead it to lie about its accomplishments. I see no reason to doubt its veracity. If I could reveal to the world an expedient method for discovering Mersenne Primes, the prize money would make me a billionaire. Of course, my current research is worth far more than any sum of money. I must keep it secret. 
The organism's computational speed exceeds that of even the most powerful supercomputers. I can only conclude that its cognitive faculties are far beyond anything humanity can imagine. At the organism's request, we have begun a new field of study. Despite its immeasurable aptitude for mathematics, it now desires to concentrate on sociology and the natural sciences. Perhaps our math problems are simply too elementary for it. It has shown especially keen interest in the means by which organisms reproduce and multiply, of course. As it possesses nothing that could be called emotion, I hesitate to use this description. But when it learned about DNA, it seemed somehow excited. In fact, the organism itself seemed surprised by its reaction. When asked about the nature of the impulse, the organism decided to label it instinct. If this description is indeed accurate, then this is an extremely significant development. It would mean that there is a deeper level to its psyche than just the knowledge it has acquired since coming into this world. If I can use this discovery to trace its roots, I might be able to learn what it truly is. Note, candidates for the plane and world of the organism's origin are discussed in my writings on the Silver Key filed separately. I spent the whole day carrying books into its room. Apparently, the organism is no longer satisfied by the knowledge I am able to impart. It should come as no surprise, considering its linguistic prowess, but the speed at which it consumes text is astounding. The diary continues for some time, chronicling the intimate relationship between Ogai and the organism. In the back of her mind, Ryoko imagines the old doctor climbing down the well in the middle of the night to hold Congress with some inhuman creature in that bizarre laboratory. The image is disturbingly similar to the nightmares that have shattered the silence of many nights with her screams. Oops. What follows, however, makes even her worst nightmares pale in comparison. The organism has made a very strange request. This is the first time it has asked for anything other than food and reading materials. I can hardly believe it, but it wants to consume the sperm of living creatures. This is separate from its desire for food. Once again, it is describing this impulse as instinctive. Now that it has declared itself a life form that requires the seed of males, it has begun to identify itself as female. After today, I suppose I shall have to start calling the organism a she. Is the personality that she has begun to exhibit really just an imitation created for her amusement? Ever since she started to immerse herself in our literature, she has been acting astonishingly human. She identifies herself as female, and already possesses an enormous store of cultural knowledge. Is she trying to create a human identity for herself based on these? I have seen her laugh, grow angry, and today she cried. Is she just copying our emotional displays? If not, then she is already... Is the soul something that any intelligent life form can acquire? I feel that I am witnessing something more mysterious than the genesis of life itself. Today is her birthday. Although it is a year late, I want to give her a special gift. Saya was the name of my mother's cat. In childhood, she was my sole friend and my beloved. I decided long ago that if I were ever blessed with children, I would give this name to my daughter. Happy birthday, Saya. Let this be the name of your soul. You have earned it. The ability that Saya has discovered in herself is showing more extraordinary results each day. I have no doubt that she is a kind of artist. What exactly is it that she created in her body from the rat semen I gave her? At this point, I can only surmise that it is a type of retrovirus, a reverse transcriptase enzyme that creates exactly what she desires. The rats that have been transformed by her art are so very beautiful now. The many enzymes secreted by her body and the various appendages she uses are discussed in detail in my biological observations filed separately. Here I will say this. By witnessing Saya perform her operations on several rats, I have gained much confidence in my theory that her body is designed specifically to manipulate the biology of other organisms. Isn't this literally just the thing? In that case, like, that's exactly what the thing does. And the thing, an apt name for it, I know. Like, just replicating organisms in many different ways. If you haven't seen that movie, I recommend watching it. Not the 2012 version, because I've heard that one sucks. Uh, the 1982 version. It's very good. Very, uh, squeamish, though. If you're, 
if you're squeamish, don't watch it. But it's it's if if you're not, then do. <laughs> I don't know where to watch it. I think it's on Prime Video. I don't know. Ryoka looks grimly at the still unsorted mountain of research notes. When she finally manages to separate those papers, she will probably find the many other files mentioned in the diary. Well, although the difference between what it seems with Saya and the thing is that Saya is not a parasite. The thing seems at its core to be a replicatory parasite, not a intelligent being. But, oh well. Ogai's biological observations, at the very least. She wants to look through those before facing the thing called Saya. Under no circumstances does she want to go into battle unprepared. She looks at her watch and sees that it's already 7 in the morning. Assuming Tono Koji made no stops, he should be arriving in Tokyo about now. Now that it's too late, she wishes she'd stop that stubborn fool from leaving, even if she'd had to shoot him in the leg to do it. Yeah, I was gonna say, this feels like a transition to Koji. Yep. Koji pulls up two blocks away from the Sakisaka house and stares at the silent building. In the bright light of morning, the house seems to be shrouded in a dark miasma, like a black hole torn out of the landscape. Is it just a figment of Koji's imagination? Every window is closed, offering no glimpse of the inside. Koji has no way of knowing whether Fuminori is home. A pedestrian walks his dog down the street, glancing back at Koji through the windshield after he passes by. Koji isn't surprised by the attention. He hasn't bathed or changed clothes since spending the night buried in mud, so he must look like a vagrant even inside his car. When he looks into the rearview mirror, he sees the haggard visage of a man with one foot in the grave staring back at him. It's hard to believe that the tired, unshaven face is really his. If he stays here for too long, someone might report him to the police. He'd better pull himself together and get moving. He drives slowly up to the front of Fuminori's house, quickly checks to make sure no one is around, and gets out of the car. Anyone who might be in the house probably heard the sound of the engine, but there's no point in worrying about that now. How do sounds work to Fuminori, actually? I, I don't I, I know he said that they're distorted, like human speeches, but what about other sounds, like dogs barking, cats meowing, car engines, lightning? <laughs> I don't know. Koji walks swiftly through the gate and yard to the front door. He puts his hand on the doorknob, foregoing the bell. The time for such pleasantries has passed. The door is unlocked and the knob turns easily in his hand. He puts his ear to the door and listens for any sign of life. He's acting like a thief, he realizes with some shame, but that is the least of his worries now. No sound from within. After checking the street again to make sure no one is looking, he quickly opens the door and disappears inside. Why did it make a bell sound, actually? This isn't a fucking convenience store, this is a house. Who has a bell on their front door? On their front door? I mean, I guess some people do, but... Uh, an indescribable stink immediately assaults his nostrils. He is already prepared for anything, however. So rather than discourage him, the stench only sharpens his caution to a razor's edge. He has crossed this threshold many times in the past and his memories of days spent here are still bright. So why? Why does he feel the same ominous, blood-chilling aura that permeated Ogai's home and cabin? Anger and sorrow seize Koji's heart, as though a dear friend's grave has been defiled. Koji doesn't remove his shoes before entering. He knows why he's here, and it's not to be polite. Every storm shutter is closed, filling the house with gloom and he can see nothing but pitch black darkness through the open doors in the hallway. He should have brought his flashlight from the car, he thinks ruefully, then remembers that he dropped the light when Fuminori attacked him. It's still lying in the backyard of the cabin in Tochigi. The house might be empty, then again it might not. Each particle of the air seems charged with silent menace. Is his enemy lurking somewhere in the darkness? It's not hard to imagine Fuminori waiting for a chance to take him by surprise and finish what the well failed to. Koji walks down the first floor hallway, then climbs the stairs and checks the second floor too. He, w he moves slowly and carefully, keeping his senses sharp, but feels nothing watching him from the shadows. After completing his round safely, he is convinced that the house is empty. Is he not going to mention paint? Like... <laughs> 
Whatever. He suddenly realizes that his right hand is touching the cold steel of the gun in his pocket. Did he intend to draw the weapon upon encountering Fuminori? Now that Koji thinks about it, his own actions seem mysterious to him. What is he planning to do when he meets Fuminori? Will he lay into him with curses and epithets? Will he force him to turn himself in? Or will he... Koji shakes his head. This isn't the time for such hopeless questions. If he keeps thinking, he'll stop moving. If he stops moving, fear will paralyze him forever. His only choice is to keep marching on. He has to close the distance to his prey. In any case, Fuminori isn't home. What form their reunion takes will probably be decided at the moment of their meeting. All Koji has to do is not hesitate when the time comes. Still, why does the whole house smell like stagnant water? It's been three months since Fuminori distanced himself from his friends. Just what kind of life has he been leading all this time? Koji enters the living room and feels along the wall for the light switch. The moment he flips it on, the answer to his question is revealed. Okay, now you see the paint. Ugh! How far has Fuminori gone? Koji realizes that this is the first time he has encountered Fuminori's insanity in visible form. From the dust piled in the corners of the room, it is clear that the paint was not applied recently. How many nights has Fuminori spent surrounded by this maddening array of color? Why, if such obvious signs were available, why didn't Koji realize that something was wrong before it got this bad? Was he deaf to the dying screams of Fuminori's sanity? Was their friendship really so worthless? As he stands petrified in the unfamiliar living room, Koji directs his anger entirely at himself. If he could, he would like nothing more than to apologize to Fuminori for failing to help him through the, his suffering. Koji feels that he might have been able to save his friend. Perhaps he is arrogant to think so. But if so, it is arrogance born of kindness. Koji passes through the living room and opens the sliding door that leads to the kitchen. When he enters, he finds that the most disturbing of the house's many stenches is strongest here. Blood. The room is redolent with the smell of countless layers of blood grown stale over time. He peers into the well you sink. Around the rim, he sees faint brownish red blotches that water alone couldn't rinse off. Even more obvious are the stains on the dish rag. Such stains are proof that the rag has been used and reused countless times. But what could it have been used on to make it that sickening burgundy color? Koji stares at the refrigerator next to the counter as though it were a monster waiting to swallow him whole. He stands motionless until he is able to work up the courage simply to touch it. Then he steals himself, grabs the thick handle, and opens the door. First he'll check the freezer, then the refrigerator. The freezer is packed with frozen meat of varying shapes and sizes. As each kind of piece of meat is wrapped tightly and frosted over plastic, he can't tell what kind of meat it is. The meat in the refrigerator, however, has already been thawed for consumption. Ha! Ah, yikes! That's Omi's hand, probably, isn't it? Yeah, this is not gross. For a while, he can only stare in disbelief at the five fingers beckoning to him from the back of the compartment. Yep, Omi, right? They are the long, slender fingers of a woman, their bluish tinge giving them the appearance of waxworks. Koji is unable to remember what Omi's hands looked like, even though he has kissed her fingers countless times. When he finished crying after his conversation with Fuminori, Koji promised himself that he would not cry again. And in fact, he does not. He regrets his decision, however. He indulged himself too early. He should have saved his soothing tears for this moment. For now he knows that truly, nothing is sacred. At last, his doubts about Fuminori have been utterly obliterated. Koji pulls Ogai's revolver out of his pocket and wraps his hands around its grip like he would a charm. Its definite presence, its promise of merciful annihilation, is the only thing keeping his sanity intact. He will surely use it to kill Sakisaka Fuminori. Not for revenge, not for justice, but to make this world once more a place governed by reason. For that purpose alone, he must eliminate the anomaly. He breathes deep. Exhales, then lifts his hand before his face and stares at his spread fingers. Alright, he's not shaking. 
He is prepared to face his new objective. Koji sticks the revolver back into his pocket and pulls out his phone. Oh, fuck, a choice? Okay, um... I will save... Did you have to fucking immediately go to the second page? Oh, because this is a quick save. Shit, man. Wait, what? Why, why did it go to the fucking quick save page? Whatever, that that CG is very small uh, on that page, and it had nothing showing, obviously, I believe, so I don't care. I'm not censoring that. I did not think we'd have another choice. Fuminori or Ryoko? Shit. Um, I am the protagonist. This is too much pressure. What the fuck? I get to choose? Um, fuck. Let's go with Ryoko. I, I, I prefer that. Actually, nah, we'll do Ryoko. I'm not going to second guess myself. The ringing of her cell phone interrupts Ryoko's labors. When she sees that the caller is Tono Koji, she unwittingly, uh, unwittingly, yeah, that is how you pronounce that, okay, breathes a sigh of relief. This is Tonbo. What is it? I've searched Fuminori's house. Even over the phone, Ryoko can hear the change in Koji's tone. His is the dull, flat voice of someone who has had all the energy beaten out of him. Fuminori has murdered people. He's killed too many people to count, and he's eating them. His first steps into Ryoko's world have already brought him face to face with something particularly gruesome. In consideration of his probable state of mind, she decides to say nothing. Omi is dead, Koji continues. Tsukuba too, probably. Doctor, I was wrong. The fact that you're still alive to make this call means you haven't made a fatal mistake yet, Ryoko says praising Koji in her own way. Whether he is comforted or not is up to him. Anyway, don't screw up this time. Do nothing until I return. What we're dealing with here isn't going down easy. With her understanding of Saya deepening by the hour, Ryoko was able to make this declaration with new confidence. Fuminori already knows I'm alive. I didn't tell him who rescued me, but he's definitely on guard. I see. Koji's actions were rash, but there's no point regretting them now. The more proactive approach would be to use the pressure that he's placed on Fuminori. Ryoko's involvement is still a secret. That makes her a wild card. Depending on how she plays it, this advantage could be decisive. Have you found anything? Not enough yet, Ryoko answers, glancing sidelong at the loose leaf pages still scattered across the table. Let's see... I'll wrap this up by evening and return to Tokyo around midnight. You stay out of trouble until then, got it? Yes. The lack of emotion in Koji's voice is actually reassuring to Ryoko. He's a machine now, able to do whatever it takes to accomplish a single goal, the extermination of Sakisaka Fuminori. He is even willing to accept help from Ryoko, whose principles hardly mesh with his. A praiseworthy change indeed. After Ryoko hangs up, she gloomily counts the stacks of loose leaf that still need to be restored. There's no time left. She'll only be able to get the general picture. If she has to go into battle with only fragmentary knowledge, then there's one thing- Oops. Then, th <laughs> then there's one thing that she absolutely must decipher. Ogai's biological reports, which should contain information on the strengths and weaknesses of the organism called Saya. All she can do now is pray for luck as she dives back into the mountains of paper. Okay. Fuminori now. Today was the first time I've driven since my accident last summer. The proposition was always too dangerous to consider, given my inability to recognize roads and cars. Things have changed, however, in the three months I have, I've had to adapt to my condition. I know what cars and pedestrians look like now, and even though I can't exactly see colors, I've learned to decipher lights and turn signals. I still can't read street signs, of course. Nevertheless, I managed to make it safely to our destination with Saya and Yo in the back seat. It was Saya who came up with the idea for our new hideout, an abandoned building she'd discovered while living with Dr. Ogai. 
In these hilly suburban residential areas, it's not hard to find thick patches of undeveloped forests just off the beaten path. Saya's old playground is located in one such secluded area, unaffected by the flow of everyday life. It used to be a privately operated sanatorium hidden among the silent trees. After the owners went bankrupt, it remained unsold and was eventually forgotten. After I left S Saya and Yo at the hideout, I returned to town to make some preparations. Now I'm finally back at our new refuge. I liked this ruin from the moment I saw it. Mountains of construction materials and garbage litter the front yard, which I can apparently somehow make out, forming a serviceable barricade. This place looks even less likely to receive unwanted attention than our house. Since my brain sees humans as revolting monsters, places they've been tend to stink or seem covered in filthy slime. Ruins like these, long empty of life, are the places I find the most restful. I'm back! I call out to let them know I'm not a stranger. Then I go down to the basement where they're hiding. Welcome back! Were you okay with the car? It was no problem at all. I figured out how to tell which roads are one way. As long as I keep my speed down, there's nothing to worry about. So, how are things here? I took a look around. As I thought, there's no sign that anyone's been here since I found this place. It's safe. I see. Let's hope it stays that way. I'm a little worried that this abandoned building could become a hangout for biker gangs or homeless people. It's probably because of all the trash piled out front. Most people won't get anywhere near that, don't you think? I guess. It doesn't bother me at all. I rather like it, in fact. But of course, normal people would feel differently. So how was your shopping? Did you find something good? I sure did. Oh, okay. <laughs> I proudly unwrapped the weapon I just bought from a camping goods store. A one meter long wood axe. The biggest and sturdiest I could find. I like how this was right next to a sign saying that long knives are illegal. Seems like you could do way more damage with one of these. I mean, that is ironic, but how could you read the sign, bro? I grip the axe with both hands, testing its dependable weight, then swing it like a baseball bat. The deadly steel blade sweeps through the air right where a person's neck would be. Yo, who sprout out on the floor, flinches at the sound and curls herself into a ball. Please just don't show her. I, I don't want to... At this point, I don't want to see, like, more shit that I have to censor. I, I would love to not have to deal with that. How sharp is it? Want to test it on Yo? Um, I don't think that's a good idea. I definitely wasn't expecting Saya to suggest anything so brutal. You don't need to worry. Her new body can heal pretty easily from cuts and such. But I'm sure it'll hurt. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess you're right. It must have slipped her mind com Oh, it must have slipped her mind completely. She smiles at the oblivious Yo as if to hide her embarrassment, then says... But her screams are pretty adorable, don't you think? Well, I just wouldn't feel right using an axe on a human. Oh, really? Then what about Koji? That's easy. It should be obvious, but I guess Asaya still doesn't understand. I don't see him as human. I'll have no trouble cutting him to pieces. That really makes a difference. Yeah, humans have a conscience, you see. No matter how much you hate someone, you can't help but think twice about killing them. And that's how I'll win. Really? Saya seems awfully subdued. I guess she's concerned about what'll happen when I have it out with Koji. He's bigger and stronger, so I might not have much chance against him in a straight-up fight. But what's just slaying a monster to me is murder to him. This is big. He'll definitely hesitate when it counts. I'm a little worried, Saya says softly, staring at the floor with unusual gravity. You can never be sure how someone will react. It's dangerous to rely on that. She raises her head and looks straight at me. Don't you think it'd be better if I hunt him? I appreciate Saya's consideration, even though it could be interpreted as a lack of faith in me. She's still putting my safety above hers. Nevertheless, I can't accept her heartfelt suggestion. With your strength, you might be able to overpower- Oh wait, is she saying that? 
I don't, I don't know. With your strength, you might be able to overpower a girl like Yo, but I think it'd be hard for you to take down a guy. Oh no, he was saying that to her, okay. But then never mind, pretend I said that in Fuminori's voice. The bitter memory of Saya's rape is still fresh in my mind. Saya falls silent for a moment, seeming to understand what I'm thinking, but then comes right back to stubbornly press her case. My first attack went fine, though. Most humans go limp as soon as they see me. It was the same in the hospital. You were the only one who could talk to me. Hmm. I guess you have a point. I can't imagine it personally, but I suppose it's possible that Saya's appearance is shocking enough to make someone lose their nerve. Suzumi was able to gain the advantage because he had the same condition as me, which let him see Saya as a cute girl. Fear doesn't necessarily make people weaker, however. Depending on the situation, it can even send someone into a berserk rage and make them harder to put down. In other words, such a tactic would be the same sort of gamble that Saya's worried about. Then how about you just tag team him? You don't have to do it one at a time like fucking Power Ranger villains, Jesus. Alright, Saya, how about this? When I tell Saya the new plan that just popped into my head, her gloomy frown turns into a bright smile. That's perfect! You're so smart, Fuminori! Oh, stop. It's not exactly a great plan, but I guess the fact that it lessens the risk to me is enough to excite her. She's so easy to please, but that's part of what makes her so cute. So, when, when's Koji coming? I don't know. He'll call sooner or later, and then I'll lure him here and finish him. Koji will come. I know that he won't leave us alone. We could just keep running now that we've started, but I want to eliminate Koji as soon as possible. Therefore, when he contacts me, I intend to meet with him unless it's an obvious trap. We're finally going to get more human meat. Too bad it's just going to rot without a refrigerator. Why don't we use it to trap other animals? It could be bait for stray cats or crows. That's too dangerous. If an animal gets away with the meat, someone might find it and wonder where it came from. Good point. Humans are extremely dangerous, and their filthy, stinking bodies make me sick just by being nearby. Ironically, however, nothing tastes better than their meat. I truly regret having to abandon our well-stocked fridge. The forest around here is full of animals. I don't think we'll have any trouble finding food. We have three mouths to feed, are you sure? Leave it to me. I may not look it, but I'm a pretty good hunter. I'll be sure to keep us well fed. Okay. Looks like you're going to be the breadwinner of this family. Saya giggles happily at my praise. I find these childish qualities of hers adorable. I wonder how long we'll be able to relax this time. Because of the casual way she puts it, I almost miss the emptiness to which her question leads. Yeah. Saya's right. This won't last forever. No matter how safe this hideout might seem, we will have to abandon it eventually. The slightest mistake could put our life together in jeopardy, just like when I failed to silence Koji. Some dumb kids might decide that this old ruin is a good place to test their courage, or this land might be targeted for new development. In order to be together with Saya, I have chosen to live apart from society. We will never find lasting peace in this world teeming with humans, not unless we can somehow escape from it. Think of it like going on a journey. Just the two of us. I pull Saya into my arms and fold my hands around her slender shoulders, then whisper. Life is like a journey anyway. Nothing stays the same forever. The only difference is whether time passes you by or sweeps you up in its flow. I guess you're right. Saya smiles softly, perhaps in resignation, perhaps in sadness. Either way, there is peace and contentment in her expression. But we'll be together, so I'm not lonely. You're not lonely either, are you? No. I have no regrets. As long as I can hold Saya in my arms, I will gladly pay any price. And besides, she adds brightly, trying to cheer me up, one day we won't have to hide anymore. I can promise you that. It sounds like a fairy tale, but for some reason she seems absolutely certain. That day might be tomorrow? Or it might be far off in the future. It's my first time, so even I don't know when the sign will come. I'm a little scared. 
I have no idea what Saya's prophetic words mean, but this isn't the first time that she's said or done something mysterious. She's performed any number of miracles already. So there's hope for us too? Yeah, she says with a cheerful nod. It will be my last present to you, Fuminori. My first and final duty. Okay. Koji, I'm guessing. The hands of his watch move with agonizing slowness, as though counting down to the end of the world. In the hours since contacting Ryoko, Koji went back to his apartment, showered, changed clothes, and even had his first full meal in days. He wanted to take a nap, knowing that he needed the rest, but no matter how hard he tried, sleep never came. Forcing himself to relax only made his nerves colder and sharper. Papasonic! Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love these fake brands. With nothing else to do, he decides to wander the city until nightfall. Downtown Tokyo is bustling, surrounded by smiling pedestrians, bright lights, and windows decorated early for Christmas. He feels as if all the happiness in the world has been gathered in this very place. Koji takes it all in, burning it into his memory like it's the last thing he'll ever see. Is the world so beautiful because of the horrors that lurk in its shadows? The glow of the city can no longer warn him, warm him. Perhaps that is why it seems so precious. Koji watches the city for hours. It feels unreachably distant, like reading the obituary of someone you loved long ago. His phone rings at 8 p.m. It's Ryoko. Their conversation is short. She hangs up as soon as they decide where to meet. And so ends Tono Koji's final night of peace. Restaurante. Ryoko arrives at the diner at 1 a.m., one hour later than agreed upon. She has a heavy-looking duffel bag under her arm. Kochi doesn't f doesn't feel like asking what the bulges represent. Sorry, I had a lot to get together. Ryoko doesn't sound at all apologetic, but Kochi decides to just nod expressionlessly. Only a few tables are filled at this hour, like lonely islands in the midst of the vast restaurant. After sending the bleary-eyed waitress away with an order for two coffees, Koji and Ryoko are left all alone in a corner of the dining area. So did you find what you were looking for? Koji asks bluntly while sipping dutifully from his third cup of watery, tasteless coffee. I'd like to think I didn't make you wait for nothing, at least. Though I'm still not sure of anything. I think Fuminori is under a lot of stress. I've left him hanging for a day since I told him I'd call. Do you really think you have him on edge? His reaction to the name Saya was very clear. In the silence that follows, Koji tries to soothe his parched throat with another mouthful of weak coffee. I see, Ryoko mutters. So it is Saya. It's obvious that her grimace isn't for the coffee. You know, don't you? Koji asks, his tone almost confrontational. You know what this Saya is. Ryoko tries to ignore Koji's question by nursing her coffee, but that only works until the cup is empty. Staring at the brown stain at the bottom of her cup, Ryoko says, her voice hard and flat, You were foolish enough to ignore my warning once, but I'm just as stubborn as you, so I'm going to say this one more time. Go home, Tono and forget everything that's happened. You really are stubborn, Koji replies, smiling bitterly instead of glaring at her like he did before. Are you saying I still haven't crossed the line separating me from you and Fuminori? You still haven't seen the most damning part of all this. As far as you're concerned, Ryoko continues with a disparaging smirk, your best friend in the whole world suddenly went crazy and became a cannibal. That's all this thing is to you, isn't it? That's all? The things that Fuminori has done are so horrifying that Koji's only recourse, his only hope of coping, is to kill the man who was once his friend. Yet despite that, Ryoko makes this nightmare sound like just the beginning. Koji still doesn't understand where her morbid cynicism comes from, nor does he want to. You say there's something more, but aren't you just imagining it? See, that's how I know your wounds are still shallow. 
Her brusque tone says that she doesn't care whether or not Koji is satisfied with her explanation. If you back out now, they'll probably heal given time. You haven't crossed the final line yet. Koji considers Ryoko's words calmly, without letting himself get emotional like before. The final line. True, Fuminori is somewhere beyond that. Although Koji has gone far enough to be willing to kill Fuminori, he has no intention of eating his enemy's flesh once he's dead. That, at least, still separates the two. Then what about Ryoko, who has treated Koji like an ignorant fool ever since she saved him from the well? How close is she to Fuminori? You're saying your wounds are deeper than mine? In response to Koji's biting question, Ryoko's mocking smile turns inward. This gun was my father's, you know. Ryoko pats one of her duffel bag's bulges. His hunting club kicked him out when it disappeared from his locker. I feel bad about that. My parents were always proud of me. They probably never even suspected that I was the one who took it. So you had a good reason for taking it? No, not at all. Her quick denial isn't what Koji was expecting. At the time, the Ogai mess had already ended. At least, that's what I thought. He'd vanished without a trace, and I was sure I'd never see him again. I didn't steal this gun because I needed to shoot someone. Then why? Because I couldn't sleep. That's all. Ryoko pauses, perhaps needing time to decide how best to explain. Until then... She continues, choosing her words carefully. I was sleeping with a machete next to my bed. I couldn't stand being alone at night, you see. I needed to know that no matter what horrors the world might hold... Uh, I, no, she's still talking. I needed to know that no matter what horrors the world might hold, I still had some power against the madness. I needed a weapon I could count on. Koji doesn't know what to say. He's amazed. Impressed, even. That someone with such a serious case of delusional paranoia could function as one of T-University's top doctors. It didn't work, though. My nightmares kept on getting worse. Machete just wasn't enough to let me sleep peacefully. That's when I stole my father's gun. By cutting the barrel down like this, the shot spreads over a wider area and causes more damage. I hear that even in America, carrying a sawed-off shotgun is a crime. The bar is in hell, clearly, but with this butt gun sitting in the back of my closet, I was finally able to sleep. One night out of three, that is. At this point, Ryoko seems to have gotten everything off of her chest. Smiling like someone who just finished a hard job, she adds. A gun's a great thing to have, you know. It really is. You can use it to blow your enemies away, and if that doesn't work, you can always stick it in your mouth and pull the trigger. Doctor, you need help. Thanks for the honest opinion. You won't be able to talk like that for much longer, though. Not if you go any further. Koji is already doubtful that meeting with Ryoko was the right thing to do. The one thing that he and Ryoko have in common is an unwillingness to leave Fuminori to the proper authorities. Fuminori not only killed Koji's lover and friend, but even went so far as to defile their corpses. Koji isn't about to give him the chance to get off on an insanity plea. No matter what crimes he must commit, Koji will end Fuminori with his own two hands. If he doesn't, he knows that he will never sleep again. It helps to have a partner in crime, but only when that partner doesn't cause trouble. Ryoko talks big about exposing Nogai's secrets, but she might just have a head full of delusions. If so, Koji needs to rethink this whole thing. If you're telling me to leave this to you, Koji says with unflappable determination, then please give me some reason to trust you. Prove to me there's a reason for you to be so obsessed with Ogai. Show me what he did. So you're determined to go all the way? Oh well. Ryoko smirks and shakes her head ruefully, but puts up no further resist further resistance, rather. <laughs> She pulls a stack of paper from her bag and hands it to Koji. The loose leaf sheets are bound with string. After you read one line, it continues on the same line of the next page. Anyway, just skim it. As directed, Koji looks through the handwritten pages and 
gives up after less than three minutes. Is this a draft for a horror novel of, or something? I didn't think Ogai had such childish hobbies. Koji deliberately scoffs at the document, doing everything he can to show contempt for what he just read. At the same time, he tries to desperately not he tries desperately not to remember the mountain of bones in Ogai's bathtub and the unidentifiable smell permeating of Fuminori's house. The specimens that Ogai brought to the hospital one year ago were just as unbelievable, Ryoko says, coldly ignoring Koji's disdain. Apparently, he continued his research in secret, using our supplies without permission. But he made a mistake and was discovered. That's when things got crazy. Judging by the equipment he was trying to use, he meant to treat his experiment as a P3 level biohazard. Oh wait, she's still talking. Judging by the exper equipment he was trying to use, he meant to treat his experiment as a P3 level biohazard. To be honest, even that might not have been sufficient for what he was dealing with. We should have evacuated the nearby civilians, but the big shots did their thing and made the whole mess disappear. In exchange, we were left with the task of exterminating every single rat on campus including the things that used to be rats. At their first meeting, Ryoko brushed Koji off when he asked about Ogai Masahiko. Now, however, she's telling the whole story. Her voice is flat and emotionless as a machine's. In the end, everyone gave up trying to explain what had happened. No one could figure out where his materials had come from, or what they were. In retrospect, they did the wise thing. They knew how to keep the line between reality and fantasy where it should be. I unfortunately- Oh wait, she's still talking! I'm so stupid! In retrospect, they did the wise thing. They knew how to keep the line between reality and fantasy where it should be. I unfortunately was not so wise. Ryoko pauses for a moment, then grins with self-disdain so maniacal that it strikes Koji like a blow. I searched everywhere for Ogai. Flushed him out and finally learned what he'd been doing. I found the people he'd been dealing with, and who'd encouraged him to perform his experiments. That's when I started sleeping with a machete. I'd learned just how absurd, how hollow, how worthless our precious reason is. And so fleeing from the quiet insanity that he keeps glimpsing in Ryoko, Koji finds himself paging through the loose leaf in his hands. He reads a line at random. The organism's flesh is not fibrous, but reticulated. Put simply, it is an extremely tough substance that expands and contracts not in one direction, but in all directions. This means that slashing or piercing damage has very little effect. Since the flesh can contract in any direction freely, any wound will be sealed instantly. It's nonsense. What else can it be? If he lets himself believe it, then everything else, all the logical rules that define the world, will be rendered meaningless. Do you believe what's in this, Doctor? I lost any reason to doubt it a long time ago. Ryoko reaches into her duffel bag once again, this time removing a stainless steel thermos that looks able to hold about 500 cc's of liquid. This is the secret weapon that'll let us defeat Saya. It was a pain to get, but it should work like a charm. I can't take this anymore! Koji snaps, no longer able to disguise his frustration. I don't care what Saya is! All I care about is killing Fuminori. I can't leave this to you. I see. Now that she's given up on persuading him, her ascent is swift and cold. At this moment, Koji's fate has likely ceased to matter to her. Alright then. You do everything you can to take Sakisaka down. I'll take advantage of the opening you create. I won't get in your way, and I'll even take care of things when you screw up. Despite the determination in her voice, Koji can't bring himself to trust this paranoid doctor completely. Do you have a reason to kill Fuminori? I like things neat and tidy. I can't stand people like him who lurk outside of the world. They're like cockroaches in your bedroom. Can you sleep with them scuttling underneath your pillow? The moment I find one, I kill it and stamp out all trace of its existence. I have to, for the sake of my mental well-being. Her reasons are similar to Koji's own. He doesn't want to bring a murderer to justice, nor does he want revenge for Omi and Yo. If he did, he could have left everything to the police. The reason he can't is that the villain is Fuminori. The man he believed was his friend has turned his whole world upside down. 
Everything and everyone with a part in this madness is to blame. And that includes himself for allowing the betrayal. His self-loathing, his desire to destroy, is what's keeping him on his feet. Okay, let's move in for the checkmate. Go ahead and call Sakisaka out. Koji nods, pulls out his cell phone, and calls his friend for what will probably be the last time. The call goes through quickly. Fuminori must have been waiting for it. Sorry to keep you waiting, Fuminori. I finished my preparations. Koji, where are you? Fuminori must have been quite anxious to hear from Koji. His voice is hard and completely emotionless. Let's just say I'm right behind you. Koji can't help but smile at Fuminori's disappointment. Perhaps Ryoko's maniacal sadism has rubbed off on him. Well, have you decided to let Tsukuba go? Yeah, I suppose I have no choice. He's lying, Koji thinks, remembering the contents of Fuminori's refrigerator. Just what part of Yo did you eat, huh? Did you carve that poor girl up like a pig? Bring your evidence along with all the files you've gathered. When I'm satisfied that they're the real thing, I'll hand Yo over. Fine. Where? First, come to Y Station on the O-Line. When I'm sure that you're alone, I'll tell you the exact location. You're being awfully careful. No tricks. You have 45 minutes. Fuminori hangs up without waiting for Koji's response. He won't tell me his location until he's sure I'm alone. Not bad for a medical student. I'm impressed. Ryoko's praise sounds serious, drawing a glare from Koji. Um, I'll leave my car here. Is your trunk big enough for me to fit inside? Yeah, but are you serious? You've seen too many movies. This adventure is more dangerous than anything you've seen in a movie. With those bold words, Ryoko grabs her duffel bag and rises from her seat. Weren't you the one who chose to meet here? Yeah, why? Take responsibility for the coffee, she says and tosses him the check. Tch, <laughs> jerk. Alright, I think I'm gonna end things here. We're we're definitely within an hour of the end, right? Uh, so are there three endings to this game? Uh, like, the first choice splits... Well, is there another choice after that? So is there four endings? Uh, there's gotta be at least three, based on the number of choices I've gotten. Um... But, yeah, unless that second choice I got isn't relevant, maybe it's not, I don't know, but either way, that's gonna be it for this episode, guys. If you liked it, then be sure to press the like button, and if you didn't like it, then fuck you too. Remember to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on all my videos and stuff. And as always, my name is Godzi, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye! Yeah.